I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi, I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe, the girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idols concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh, why were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm. I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP, forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow. And that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it. From attentive service, amazing live music, and great food. It was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh, my God. That's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away. No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time. This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um, wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac, the missing singer! I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. Gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac? Are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. So, last night, when we were separated in the after-concert chaos... Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh. She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then we've already parted ways last night, but 
but my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But, wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job. How can she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope. You must help us, please. Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in ten years. This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not-so-good ones. Especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress. Take it off right now! Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room, and even stopped to pose at the end. Poof, it's just an old dress. Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends, and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, 
and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine. I didn't want to share a bed with her. But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs. Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh! It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him. But then, everything fell apart. And I hadn't touched the piano since, well... <sighs> until today, I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past. Until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing?! Let me tell you something. Something really important. I have acrophobia, so this is my idea of a nightmare. I don't want to be here at all. Oh, and that guy on the other side is Charlie. He's my boyfriend, but I don't actually like him like that. So you're probably wondering how I ended up here, 200 meters above the ground and about to make this terrifying leap. Well, let's just start from the beginning. Hi, I'm Luna, a 17-year-old high school girl from a small town in New South Wales. Growing up, I was desperate to please my hard-working single mom. The problem was she was nearly always tired and irritable. So no matter what I said or did, it usually ended up being wrong. The most common words that came out of her mouth were, If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. I wanted her to love me more than anything else in the world, so I did everything I could to appease her. This led to the need to make everyone happy and left me with an unfathomable fear of being hated by others. If I made other people happy, then they'd like me, right? So whenever someone asked me to do their homework or cover for them on roll call, I did so without hesitation. And if there's ever an argument or awkward situation, regardless of if I'm to blame or not, I always apologize first. At 15, I moved to Sydney alone for high school. And that's when I met my roommate Margot. She's my complete opposite, but this didn't stop us from becoming best friends. She is independent sassy, and doesn't let anyone pressure her into doing anything she doesn't want to. Guys, if I were more like her, I would have been able to avoid a lot of trouble. Once we had a group assignment in biology, and I by chance teamed up with these two popular girls, the day before the deadline, they both texted me, saying they were sick, and asked me to do their parts. This was a lot of work for one person, but I didn't want to upset them, so I agreed. But then, that night, while I was scrolling through Instagram during my brief break after hours of studying, I saw them checking in at a party. What? So they lied to me so they could go out and have fun and left me home alone to do their homework? Oh my, I just want to take this pen and throw it right at their dumb duck faces. How was that cute in any way? Ugh, but who was I kidding? I knew full well I'd never be able to tell them what I really thought of them. So I picked up the pen and continued my workload meant for three people alone. I stayed up all night and drank three cans of energy drinks, but it was just too much work for one person to finish on time. Our assignment, or should I say my assignment, got points deducted due to late submission, which somehow made the popular girls mad. What have you done? How could you turn in the assignment late? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just that doing it all by myself was a bit too much for me. Oh, please. You had the whole day to finish it. It's all down to your poor time management. Right at that moment, Margot appeared out of nowhere and stepped between us. Pfft. If you both cared so much about your grades, then you would have helped Luna complete it. Instead of going to some stupid party, how about I report you to the teacher to cross out your names from Margot? Enough. Sorry, don't mind her. Then I quickly pulled Margot away. 
apologizing to them was a ridiculous thing to do. It wasn't your fault. I, I know it's not my fault, but, but there's no point making a scene out of it, right? Fine. In that case, I'll leave you alone with all the troubles you've caused yourself. I don't care anymore. Oh, no, I, I didn't mean to make Margot mad. I quickly apologized to her, told her she was my best friend in the whole world, and asked her to go for a milkshake to make up. A week later, on the day my volunteer club was selling lemonade to raise funds for a children's charity, I suddenly fell sick. Oh no, I had been telling everyone at the club how important this event was, but now I was the one who'd be absent. How embarrassing! I needed to show them how sincere I was. I texted the club president that I was sick, but if the club really needed me, I could still try to participate. Ah, <sighs> now I can finally sleep. But who would know? Before I even had time to curl up in bed, he texted back saying how they really needed my help. So if I could come, that'd be great. Oh, no. Did I really have to drag my feverish self over there? Not knowing what to do, I turned to Margot for advice. But she snapped at me. If you knew you couldn't go, why suggest otherwise? People will always take advantage of you if you let them. So just make it clear that you're sick and can't participate. Then she told me how her music club had a dinner meeting tonight, yet she'd already decided she was having a relaxing pamper session tonight, so she immediately told them she was otherwise engaged. Ugh. Margot was right. If I'd done as she said in the first place, I wouldn't have had to rack my brains looking for excuses to say no without annoying anyone. Finally, I texted the club president that I was afraid of infecting everyone so I'd better stay home. Then I fell asleep and found my worries plaguing my dreams. The next day, I felt better. So after class, I dropped by the club's room, but I instantly felt weird vibes from everyone. Then when I asked the club president how much money we'd earned from the event, he totally blanked me. Oh, no. He was obviously still mad with me for letting him down. I was lost in thoughts when suddenly someone tapped me on the shoulder. I heard you were sick. Are you feeling better now? It was Charlie, one of the club members. He told me that day I was off sick. He voluntarily took over all of my work. So I invited him out for a thank you dinner right away. Hmm. Maybe he misunderstood my goodwill jester, as after that he bombarded me with texts, calls, and soppy memes. Then one day while we were walking together... Charlie suddenly stopped and took my hand. Luna, we've known each other for a while now. I think it's time for me to confess my feelings. I, I like you. Will you go out with me? Oh my. What did he just say? I stood there dumbfounded. I mean, I liked him as a friend, but not romantically. But when I met his expectant gaze, my conscience began to torment me. He was such a nice guy, so how could I say no to him? In the end, I, I forced a smile then nodded in agreement. My feelings for him will develop over time, right? But unfortunately, the answer to this was no. <laughs> Actually, since we started dating, I found myself liking him even less than before. He does a lot of things that irritate me, such as the time he insisted we wear couple outfits to school. Yeah, slogan shirts with he's mine, she's mine printed on them should definitely be left in 2010. Ugh. He smugly ushered me around the school and seemed oblivious to the laughs and points in our direction. If only the ground could just open up and swallow me right away. That evening, noticing how fed up I looked, Marco asked me if everything was going all right between me and Charlie. So I told her everything. I thought she'd get mad at me again, but to my surprise, she just sighed and told me to tell the truth and break up with Charlie before things got too serious. That's the best way to stop both of us from getting hurt. And also, I've heard a lot of bad things about Charlie. People say he's kind of erratic. You better get this over with as soon as possible. Yeah, Margot's right. Next time I saw Charlie, I was ending this once and for all. Turns out I didn't have to wait long, because that Sunday afternoon, Charlie came to pick me up for our date. He told me he had a surprise in store for me, and I was gonna love it. Okay, it sounds like he'd gone to loads of effort, so it was probably best if I left breaking up with him until the journey home. Almost there! Hearing what Charlie said, I looked out the window and... Oh my god! Is that a bungee jumping spot? So, long story short, here I am. 200 meters off the ground, my legs trembling like a leaf and my heart thudding like crazy. I was about to cry out of fear when suddenly I heard romantic music playing behind me. I turned around to see Charlie getting down on one knee. Behind him was eagle-eyed staff holding roses and candles while swaying to the music. Um, what's happening? I know we haven't been dating long, but it's clear that we're made for each other. Luna, will you marry me? What? Did I hear him wrong? I mean, I'm only 17. Seeing my puzzled look, Charlie hurriedly said, I know we're still in high school, but 
Don't worry, we can wait till graduation. Then let's have the most wonderful wedding straight after that. This was insane. I stood there, rooted to the floor, not knowing what to do, and seeing everyone watching and waiting made me feel even more pressured. I was trying to figure all this out when Charlie forced the ring on my finger. Oh my god. What should I do? What should I do? Well, in classic me fashion, I didn't do anything. My stupid hand just froze in place. And in the end, it turned out like this. No, no, I, I couldn't let this happen. Charlie, actually, I... I... Um, I don't have feelings for you. I, I was going to tell you today, but I, I didn't expect things to end up like this. You're kidding me, right? If you didn't like me, you wouldn't have let me put the ring on earlier. So I explained everything to Charlie. His face darkened with disappointment. I felt so guilty. I should have just been straight with him from the beginning. Then none of this would have happened. We can still be friends, can't we? I asked, but Charlie replied without even looking at me. If you don't like me, then why give me hope? Why the emotionless tone? It felt like he'd turn into a completely different person. Af afraid, I, I kept quiet not daring to blurt out so much as a word. I'd be home soon and away from this suffocating atmosphere. But as Charlie drove, I noticed how the surroundings became stranger and stranger. This is definitely not the way to the dormitory. Finally, the car stopped at an abandoned construction site. Luna, get out of the car. Sensing his irritable tone, I did as he said. You can stay here until you figured out that we're destined for each other. Then call me. I watched in horror as he drove away and left me there. I was all alone, in the middle of nowhere. Panicked, I called Margot for help, but as soon as she picked up, my phone ran out of power. I explored the area, but it was completely deserted. Would I be stuck here forever without anyone knowing? It was getting late. I'd barely eaten or drank anything all day, and this felt hopeless. I burst into tears, and then everything fell dark around me. I woke up to the bright lights of the hospital. Margot jumped in to give me a hug, then explained what had happened. Turns out that night after I called her, she checked my location on Snapchat and saw that I was in some deserted place. Sensing something was off, Margot and the dormitory manager went to find me and took me to the hospital. Charlie was disciplined and detained for a month for the trouble he'd caused. After that horrible experience, I talked a lot with Margot. She comforted me, encouraged me, and said that it seemed like my desire to please others stemmed from childhood trauma. Perhaps it was my mother's words. If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. That created the character I have now. I couldn't continue to let the past consume me. That summer, when I returned home to see my mom, together, we poured out our feelings and faced our problems. I finally figured out that being nice to people wasn't a bad thing, but agreeing to things just to avoid disappointing people isn't the correct thing to do at all. Now, with Margot's help, I'm step-by-step step learning to say no to things I don't want to do. Because life's way too short to say yes to everything, don't you think? Hi, I'm Viola, and today is a big day. You see, it's my first time ever acting in this awesome short film, but I can't seem to focus at all. Why, you ask? Well, that's because I just discovered... I'm not real. Or, to be exact, I only exist in my best friend's imagination. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Until yesterday, I always thought of myself as a completely normal human being. <sighs> Let me tell you how it all started. The first memory I have involves my best friend Harlow. I woke up feeling dazed and confused and saw this pretty girl smiling down at me. She told me that I'd be safe now, and that her parents were going to look after me. Strangely, I couldn't remember anything before that day, and no one told me what had happened. I could only guess that I'd probably been abandoned or something, and that Harlow and her parents were my saviors. So, from then on, I lived with Harlow's family, who showed me kindness and love. When I first got out of the hospital, I couldn't do anything by myself from personal things like brushing my teeth and washing my face, to chores such as doing laundry and dumping the trash. At the time, it was Harlow who guided and helped me, like a caring big sister. Then, when we entered middle school and the boys started flirting with me, Harlow was always by my side to protect me. She told me how they would never like a plain, boring girl like me, and that they were only doing this to get close to her. 
that she was very beautiful. If I had a decision to make, big or small, I always consulted Harlow first, as I knew she'd know best. But recently, I noticed that Harlow was acting short-tempered with me. When I got a better grade on my English essay than her, she told me I only got that mark as the teacher just felt sorry for me. Then she stormed off. Man, I didn't mean to upset her, and it was really unfair that the teacher didn't give her the grade she deserved, as she's far smarter than I am. Then last week, this boy called Hank in our school's film club held open auditions for his short film project. Harlow was desperate to be in it, so I decided to go along with her for support. I thought Harlow's audition was marvelous, but for some reason, she wasn't picked. I was about to leave too, but then Hank asked me if I wanted to audition. So I did, and you know what? I got the lead role. I was so surprised, and so was Harlow. She insisted that they were just tricking me, and I shouldn't take the part, as why would they choose a girl with ordinary looks like me to play the female lead? But still, I wanted to give it a try. Opportunities like this don't come twice, right? So I accepted the part. I know Harlow was worried that they were just teasing me, but Hank and his crew seemed nice. And maybe he finds my normal look suitable for the character. Right? The morning before the shooting day, I asked Harlow to lend me her pretty white dress to wear to the shoot. Harlow looked annoyed as she said, You spilled coffee on that dress last time you borrowed it, remember? You didn't even bother taking care of it, and now the stain's still there. No way! I remember washing it before returning it to you. Well, then you remember it wrong. It's my dress, so I'm hardly going to forget what you did to it, am I? Then she left in a temper. Strange. I remember using vinegar to clean the coffee stains, as it took me ages to scrub it off. But it is true that my memory isn't all that good. When I was a child, I once waited in the park in the rain for over an hour, just because I thought Harlow told me to meet her there on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday afternoon. I have piano practice today, silly. So maybe I misremembered again and really didn't wash the dress for her? That day in math class, Harlow got caught texting, so the teacher confiscated her phone. At break time, she asked me to sneak into the school administrator's room to get her phone back. But of course I refused, as I was far too scared to do that kind of stuff. It's okay, no one can see you. Basically because you only exist in my imagination. What was she talking about? What did she mean by that? For the rest of the lesson, I kept thinking about Harlow's words. When the bell rang, seeing that I was still confused, Harlow pointed to a group of students standing nearby and told me that no matter what I did, they wouldn't see me. And that's true! When I waved my hands and talked to them, no one looked in my direction. I even snapped my fingers in front of them, but they didn't react at all. What is going on? Harlow told me that because she imagined me, she's in control of who sees me or not. Then she told me that if I still didn't believe it, I should go to the school administrator's room to get her phone. Then I'd see that she was telling the truth. The superintendent was standing right across the hallway, but Harlow assured me I'd be invisible to her. My heart was thudding like crazy, but I tried to shake back my nerves and continued to get her phone undetected. Whoa, the superintendent didn't see me at all! So what Harlow said was true? I only existed in her imagination? That means... Harlow's really the one who decides what will happen to me. And who I'll meet? So basically the author of my life story. But does that also mean that I have no control over my own life? Well, if I even have a life. Then Harlow barged into my room and said, You've never wondered why you don't remember anything about your parents and about the time before you met me, have you? It was because I lost my memory after the accident. There was no accident, Viola. You have no previous memories because that was when I created you, as I wanted a friend to play with. I kept this truth a secret because I love you, and you always listen to me. But you've been so headstrong lately. After Harlow left, I found myself feeling so down. It turned out my whole life had never belonged to me. No wonder I was so plain and ordinary. All I am is a side character in Harlow's story. After a horrible, sleepless night, I didn't even feel like going to the film set anymore. And it's already late anyway. I was laying in bed, spacing out, when Hank phoned me asking where I was. 
I only exist in Harlow's imagination, so there's no point filming. Huh? What nonsense are you going on about? Stop joking, Viola. We're short on time over here. Seeing that I didn't even bother to reply to him, but just let out a long sigh, he continued. All right then, if that's the case, then you should at least make it count. Would you like to imagine yourself as just a boring nobody? Or a brilliant actress? I suppose Hank's words made sense, so I got myself back together and hurried to the film set. Even if I'm imaginary, I'll make this unreal life of mine unimaginably awesome. The filming was actually a lot of fun, and everyone complimented my acting. Hmm, they were probably just being nice, but it still felt good. Then Hank came over and congratulated me. Now that filming's over, you can be honest with me. I don't mind. I know you only cast me as the lead as you like Harlow. What do you mean? And the thing you said this morning as well about only existing in Harlow's imagination? I ended up blurting out everything to him, and you know what he did? He laughed. But when he saw that I was struggling to fight back my tears, he took my hand. Viola, listen to me. Harlow's tricking you. The only thing not real in all of this are her words, not you. No way. Harlow's my best friend. She would never do such a thing. If you only existed in Harlow's imagination, how come you still decided, on your own, to show up at film set this morning? How come you still meet other people without her being around? Like, right now? Harlow couldn't have written the script with all these little details, right? Come on, Vi. Think about it. But there was a time when Harlow made me invisible to everybody else. I snapped my fingers in front of them, and they didn't react at all. Hank asked me who these people were, and I told him. He said he'd make sure I saw sense. Then he left. This was so confusing. I cannot tell what is real and what's not anymore. The next day at school, when I was sorting my locker out, Hank dragged a reluctant-looking boy over to me. I recognized him. He was part of the group who didn't see me. Go on. Tell her everything. The boy told me how Harlow had bribed them to trick me. He also said that they distracted the superintendent so I could sneak into her office without being caught. What? I didn't understand why Harlow would do this to me. Hank went with me to confront her, and she faked a smile and said, Silly Viola, it was just a joke. So what about the fact that I can't remember anything about the time before I met you? You said there was no accident. It's also a lie, isn't it? I never said that. Probably you misremembered again like so many times before. I view you as a sister, Viola. I'd never lie to you. I didn't know what to believe anymore. I needed to be alone for a minute. This was all too much to process. So I ran to the nearby park to clear my mind. Suddenly, I felt something cold next to my cheek. It was Hank. He passed me some water and told me to drink it and calm down. Viola, I think Harlow's gaslighting you. She's basically emotionally abusing you to make you question your own sanity. I know you see her as a sister, but she's really toxic. Could it? Could it be possible that Harlow didn't have my best interests at heart? But what did she even get out of this, though? I'm not sure if this was because she wanted me to rely on her or she's jealous, but either way... Knowing she could deceive me like that hurt like crazy. I didn't want to believe that that was what had been happening, but after all explanations, it's so clear now that Harlow was gaslighting me. And ever since then, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. But this was tricky, seeing as we were in the same class and lived together. I just wished I could grow up fast, so I could go to college and leave this house. At least there was good news. Hank's film in which I starred had gained attention on YouTube, and he was even selected to attend the short film festival with a view to supporting the city's young, talented filmmakers. Then, one day, I arrived home from school to see Harlow's parents drinking coffee with a strange woman. Huh? She sure looked a lot like me. Suddenly, she was running over to me and hugging me in her arms. Oh, darling, you have no idea how long I've been waiting for this moment. Following a whole lot of confusion, shocking revelations, and emotions, 
I finally found out the actual truth. It turned out that when I was seven years old, mom took me on a yacht trip. Only there was a terrible accident, so we took the lifeboat to shore. But then mom fell out and ended up being rescued by another boat. We both suffered memory loss. In fact, mom only remembered who I was when she saw the short film I starred in on YouTube. And then she tracked me down here. After that, I returned to live with my real mom. And guess what? I now realize just how awesome I am. I'm grateful to Harlow's parents for looking after me, but I still haven't forgiven Harlow yet. I'm trying to, as I know she's not all bad, but it's going to take some time. I also feel so blessed to have Hank by my side to help me discover my confidence and value my own worth. He even says I can be in his next film project, which I'm really excited about. It's good to know that I'm actually real, and I exist outside of Harlow's mind. The world is mine for the taking. And who knows, maybe one day I'll end up being a professional actress. 98, 99, one more to go. And 200,000 followers. <laughs> It looks like I'm making quite an impression on the world. Hey, you're looking at the hottest beauty and lifestyle influencer of Park Springs High School. Beauty and brains? I have both. <laughs> it's not surprising, is it? Obviously, a girl like me gets loads of attention. Oh, there are Nerdy Ben is. My number one fanboy. He's always following me around school and offering to help me with, well, Everything. I can't blame him. I mean, I'm basically his queen. Hey, Ben. I didn't see you at my locker as usual. Are you... good? I... I'm out of money today, so... Wait, Ben. Don't say it like that. People will think I mugged you or something. I never ask for those groceries or sundries. Y yes, you don't. Um... Sorry. Okay, so that was weird. Then things got even stranger when I overheard Christine telling her friends that after being exposed, an anonymous IG singer's followers had skyrocketed to a whopping 500,000. But the thing was, she went to school here. She's that nobody in bio class, Stella. Stella hurried past me into class followed by a flock of people trying to take her pick and asking her to sing. Blah, blah, blah. Some of the boys even offered to take her home after class. Poof, please. What were they thinking? Ugh, she could play the fragile and confused act on these losers, but she didn't fool me. The dropped book scenario was so overrated. But, huh? Why was Ben rushing to pick it up. What a traitor. Ben, where's my homework? He couldn't even come up with a better excuse than, um, I went out last night. This was baloney. I just heard him offer to help Stella with her homework. And guess what? This girl, still with her Little Miss shy facade up, told Ben that she could do her own essay. Ugh. Did she think she was Beyonce or what? Acting all high and thinking she's the beacon of the universe? I was furious. So she wanted a taste of fame, huh? Let's just say, as a senior in this field, having experienced its downside, it was time I taught her some manners. <laughs> After that, I made sure she became the main topic of every single talk in school. Hey, she needed to learn how this fame game worked. Everyone was giggling, pointing, and whispering behind her back. She had to cover herself with a hoodie that hid half of her face and walk through school in anxiety. Yeah, I know that paranoid feeling all too well when you obsess with why people keep on giving you odd looks. Then one day, I was putting my books back in my locker when I glimpsed someone running past me crying. It was Stella and she dropped a note that said, if I were you, I wouldn't have shown up at school ever again. You're a joke. Gosh, do people even say these things? This was way too harsh.
What happened? For God's sake. He didn't think I was the one who wrote this, did he? From that day on, Ben completely ignored me. And worse, he was glued to Stella, comforting her as people talked behind her back. Ugh. Then one day, I was tying my shoelaces when I heard some cheerleaders trying to open someone's phone. Right at that moment, Stella stepped out of the shower stall. Upset to see others violating her privacy, she tried to fight back. But oh boy, this wallflower couldn't even make them budge. <sighs> Fine, I'll help her. But only this time. You tattletale! You think you run the place now just because you're popular? Go tell Ben I didn't put that note in your locker. Better yet, call him right now. Oh, come on. Just run to the bleachers and tell that nerd. Go! What are you looking at? I went over to the bleachers to find Ben comforting Stella. What now? Snitching on me again? Actually, Stella was just telling me that you didn't write that note. Could you be any more foolish? So, you're just gonna bluntly do whatever I tell you to? Don't mind her. It's just who she is. A bit rough, but a truly great friend. Uh, I don't make friends. Yeah, I'd learned it the hard way. Back in my early days on Instagram, the only friend I trusted posted a video of me changing in the school's shower stall. I still had my tea inside my shirt, but that taught me a cruel lesson about friendships and fame. When you're famous, people will always want something from you. You can't trust anyone at all. You hear me? Stella! Who's that? Liam, Stella's friend from the music club. They look good together, don't they? What? Are you jealous of him or something? For that silly chick? Ben didn't say anything, but just blankly stared at them. Huh? He never looked at me like that anymore. Now I was no longer the Instagram queen. That meant I was no longer his queen. <sighs> it was true there was no one I could trust. A few days later, there was a big football match. We were going up against our rival school for the final, and Stella was singing the national anthem. Even the mayor and a local TV station showed up for it. Crazy! Ben was part of the AV team, so when some dude told me Ben wanted to talk to me, I went to the AV room to find him. What did he want to talk about? Hopefully not something to do with Stella. Ugh! But as I got there... No one was around. Huh? Right at that moment, the screen showed Stella stepping up to the podium preparing to sing. But instead of the soothing melody, a string of strange, distorted sounds came out of her mic. What was going on? What are you doing here? Ashley! He pushed me aside and hurriedly fixed the sound system. And just a minute later, things were back to normal and Stella could restart the song. Ben gave me an accusing look, then dragged me behind the bleachers, where we met up with Stella and Liam. Then Ben told her I'd messed with her mic. Ugh! How could he think I was capable of something like that? Meanwhile, this Liam guy stepped in, saying it could have been a technical error. Yeah, whatever. I went to leave, but Liam caught up with me. Weird. Weren't he and Stella having a thing? He immediately denied it, saying they were just acquaintances from music club. But you, I've been wanting to get closer to you for a while. You're the true Instagram queen, not Stella. Whoa, this guy was a top-class jerk. Just a minute ago, he had his hands wrapped around Stella, and now he was trying to leech onto me. He even started leaning in to kiss me on the cheek. Quickly, I dodged it as I met Stella's gloomy look from behind. Yikes. It was time to get out of here. I didn't sleep so well. Ugh. All this stress was bad for my skin. So I was groggily making my way along the school corridor when Stella stormed up to me. It was you, 
wasn't it? You were so mean to me, threatening to delete my IG account because you were so jealous Ben had left you for me. Now it's really gone, and it's all your fault. What are you talking about? I had nothing to do with your stupid account. Yeah, I gossiped about you to mess with you a bit, but that was all. And you, you think I did it too? Excuse me? Did he just ignore me? And there Ben was, my so-called friend who turned his back at me right at the moment I needed him the most. And I'd never threatened to delete her account. Why did she make it up? Was she that jealous of me and Liam yesterday? What's this? An unexpected message from Liam said, Hey Ashley, don't worry sweetie, I've got your back. What do you say we meet at 8 p.m. in the park? Ugh, this shameless two-faced jerk. What was he up to this time? So after class, I slid a note into Stella's locker, pretending to be from Liam, saying, I have a surprise for you. See you at 8 p.m. in the park. I arrived on time to find Liam already waiting. He kept putting on this simping act like he was madly in love with me or something. I can help you prove everything, and I only ask for one tiny favor, that you'll be my girlfriend. You can do that? But how? Well, you can just simply put the blame on someone else. Let's say, Ben? Oh, honey, you don't have to do anything. Just come to me and let your man handle it. Ugh, this guy made me want to barf. But I still had to play it cool so I could figure out what this dude had up his sleeves. Sounds interesting, but I want to know more. How are you going to carry out your master plan? Honey, I've already got all the pieces of evidence in my hands. <laughs> you mean... That's right. I was the one who deleted Stella's IG account, and I know a way to blame it on someone else. You did what? Ashley, I let my jealousy blind me. So when I saw him flirting with you right in front of me, I... I just lost it. At least you're not the only fool around here. He played both of us. And for the record, he's so not my type. <laughs> <laughs> Your type? Hmm, let me guess. Someone like... Ben? <laughs> he's such an idiot. He'd never realize I have feelings for him. But you're more of his type than I am. Besides... The way he just abandoned me when I needed him the most. Uh, Ashley, I didn't mean to hurt you like that. What? You've been there the entire time? Yeah, I've heard it all. Including the part about how you have feelings for me. Look, it's not what you think. I'm not into Stella that way. The thing is, I saw her singing at a coffee shop and realized right away she's my favorite anonymous singer on Instagram, so I sort of revealed her identity online. One thing led to another. I felt so guilty I just stayed by Stella's side and accidentally pushed you away. And it's not that I don't trust you. After you left, I tried to convince everyone you didn't do it, but they didn't believe me. Then Stella showed me the note in her locker of Liam asking her out, and I recognized your handwriting. I got worried, so... So, you didn't turn on me? Yeah, I know you can seem cold sometimes, but deep down you have a good heart. So, turns out that Stella going viral meant some local lounge singer had lost a lot of gigs, so she hired Liam to delete Stella's account for good. This guy was no joke. The note, the cheerleaders, the mic accident... He was responsible for it all. Luckily for me, I'd managed to put my phone on record mode for the entire conversation I had with him. So the next day, I went ahead and reported him to the principal. Well, no bad deed goes unpunished. So I hope you enjoy your indefinite suspension, Liam. <laughs> as for me, I no longer go solo anymore, as I have a new friend by my side, who now has quit social media and enjoys her passion for singing. And Ben is still Ben, 
Such a doofus. But my doofus. Hi, I'm Kate, and I'm doing something totally thrilling. I'm running away. Just picturing my parents' worried faces makes me smile. Why, you ask? They deserve it for trying to send me, their beloved only daughter, to some disgusting girls' boarding school. Yuck! No parties, the grossest uniform, bossy supervisors, and no hot-muscled guys. Ugh! That place is for nerds, not me, an it girl and the founder of Clique Chic, our school's exclusive group for the hottest, most sought-after girls. To be a part of the club, you must be really fashionable, you know? I'm talking about a wardrobe full of the latest designer must-haves, manicured nails, and the glossiest hair. Only girls as dazzling as us can make the school hallway our catwalk stage. As one of us, your life will be filled with endless parties and super cute jocks fighting for your attention. Studying and homework? <laughs> That's not our thing. Those loser nerds who are chasing after us will take care of it. Hey, do you know those people? I looked outside and saw a group of bodyguards who were yelling and trying to force my cab to stop. Ugh, this was so uncalled for. 500 bucks if you can get rid of them. The driver immediately sped up. Ha! <laughs> Ordinary people will do anything for a little bit of money. He dropped me off at a service station and I quickly snuck inside and hid in the restrooms. Ew! This place was gross! Gosh! Those bodyguards were loitering about outside so no one could leave or enter without them seeing. How tragic! This was so stupid. All my parents needed to do was let me stay at home for the summer. But no, they sent those bodyguards after me to ruin my life. Suddenly, a cubicle door flung open and knocked into me. Ouch! Are you blind? What are those glasses even for? I... I'm sorry. The girl quickly apologized, then she bent down to pick her fallen stuff up. But when she looked up, I gasped in shock. Holy guacamole! What in the world? She looked exactly like me. I mean, at least her face did. Her style was disgusting and old-fashioned. Ew. But given my dire situation, I came up with an amazing idea. Okay, so this is weird. Do you want to make some money? And I mean a lot of money? She gave me this dumbfounded look. Ew. I hope I didn't get frown lines like she did when I screwed up my face. They were ghastly. I have a really lucrative job for you. As you can see, we have similar faces. Freaky, but fortunate. So I need you to pretend to be me and live my rich life for a month or two. Here's my Twitter account. Just skim through it. You can learn everything about me there. It should be enough for you to play the part and avoid my family's suspicion. And here's your payment. I rifled through my bag and handed her the rest of the cash. Jeez, this must be a huge amount for her, as her eyes lit up like she was seeing money for the first time, and she immediately took it. We quickly exchanged clothes, and as instructed, she went outside to hand herself over to the bodyguards. Ah, freedom! Now bring on one long, hot summer of fun. But first, I have to go shopping. Wearing these old-fashioned, disgusting clothes made me want to puke. Oh no! My parents have locked all of my credit cards! I can't even buy a soya milk ice latte now! Oof! How could my parents be so cruel? The worst part is, I had stupidly given all my cash and my phone to that girl! With no other options left, I reluctantly searched the girl's bag. A few old-fashioned clothes, some stupid books, and an unbranded lipstick? Huh? Was that all? How can people live like this? But, hmm, what's this? In her small notebook was a train ticket and an offer letter to work at Homestay Allen. So, looks like she's going there for a summer job. Hopefully that homestay has a bath with scented candles and a pool for me to sunbathe by. I need to work on my tan. I was glad to get off that flea-ridden thing and breathe in some fresh air. Hmm, 
Now where was my ride? There was a short, chubby old man holding a board with the name Clara on it. Ah, the name on the train ticket was Clara. So this meant he was here for me? Ugh, he didn't even have flowers with him, and he could have at least combed his hair. So, turns out, that's Danny, the manager and owner of the homestay. Honestly, if it wasn't for the circumstances, I would never have set foot in this stupid place. Oh, how the day got worse. Without even being allowed to rest my weary feet, Danny gave me work. Housekeeping. It was a joke, wasn't it? My nails were not made for menial jobs. Life here was horrible. I had to get up so stupidly early that it was still dark out, then clean a dozen dusty old bedrooms. After that, I would do the laundry, dry the towels and bedding, fold them, and arrange them neatly into each room. At noon, I also had to help the chef here, Anna, prepare lunch, and I was also forced to wash a mountain of gross dishes. I had never done such silly chores like this at home. Instead, they were always done for me. Didn't expect them to be this exhausting. <laughs> you should put them in order, so they won't break. Ugh, where did this nosy guy come from? Are you lecturing me? I replied crankily and walked away. Suddenly... Oh no! This was the ninth time I'd broken stuff since I'd arrived here! And that wasn't counting my poor broken nails. I quickly bent down to clean up, but... Ouch! I cut my finger on one of the pieces. The guy quickly ran over and bandaged my wound. Bond, that's my name. Huh? What's this? Did he just wink at me? My heart was pounding. Um, I mean, he was cute. Yeah, he was really cute. Um, I'm Kay- Clara. Go do something else. Leave this to me. Realizing that I'd been staring at Bond for a while, I hurriedly got up and rushed to the kitchen. Nice to meet you, Clara. I'm your new colleague. Well, that's not so bad. At least I have someone to share my workload with and to chat. The next morning, I was cleaning the floor, half asleep, when Bond came over, put an AirPod in my ear, and winked at me. Imagine you're dancing. Then you won't feel so tired anymore. Okay, this sounded kind of lame, but at least no one else was around to see me, so I decided to just go with it. So I gave it a try, with Bond, <laughs> and I relaxed a little. Well, I didn't expect it to be so much fun. That night, as I was about to turn off the light, I heard a knock at the door. It was Bond. He wanted to show me a secret, so he took my hand and led me to the beach. Yes, we were holding hands, and his hand was really warm. He took me to a sandy beach and shone his flashlight at his feet. Something was moving under the fine white sand. Ew! What was that? I clung to his arm in fear. Aww, little turtles! I exclaimed as they slowly emerged from under the sand. Yes, they're cute, aren't they? Let's give them a hand. They have to get to the sea before dawn. I hesitated because I thought this was so stupid. When the sun rises, they'll be easily spotted and eaten by predators. Fine. Since Bond pleaded, I had no choice but to sacrifice my sleep to escort the baby turtles to the sea. Why would their mom just abandon her babies like that? Their mom protected them when they were eggs and now it's time for them to start fending for themselves. I bet they don't mind. You see, they're all trying their best to crawl towards the sea. But it was us who helped them. Then they'll be very grateful to you. And so am I. Whoa, I never felt like this before. It felt like my heart was aching, but in a good way? Thinking about it, I suppose this was the first time I'd ever helped anyone before. Now I kinda understood why my parents did what they did. They just wanted me to be more independent and stop hanging around with those vain, show-off girls. They sure would be pleased if they could see me now, with this sweet and gentle guy. He was the total opposite of the rich boys back home. 
when I was hurt, he made sure I was okay. He opened my eyes to new experiences, and he didn't try to impress me with dumb flowers and expensive gifts. I've been thinking about Bond all day, and this is the 1,000 and first time I've peeked at him. I think I'll have to confess my feelings before I go crazy. So that evening, after finishing all my work, I knocked on Bond's door. Huh? Why was a teary-eyed Miss Anna standing there? Then she told me the shocking truth. Bond had left without saying goodbye. Panicked, I walked into the room, but there was nothing left of his. Nothing! No! This couldn't be happening! I hadn't even had a chance to confess yet! The next day, I felt so down, it sucked not having Bond here. But then in my zombie state, I accidentally picked up the newspaper at the front desk. O.M.G. On the front page was a picture of... Bond! God, I couldn't believe it! He was the son of a famous billionaire and they were looking for him! Turns out, I wasn't the only one who'd run away from home. But why did he leave so suddenly? He could have told me the truth. He could have said bye! Ugh! My untold feelings for him felt like an unreachable splinter in my side. I couldn't carry on like this. I needed to find Bond. With my meager salary, I got on the train back to the city, imagining seeing Bond again. This is without a doubt the most nervous I'd ever been in my entire life. It didn't matter how much I pleaded my case and explained that I was Bond's friend. The security guards refused to let me in. I was about to leave when suddenly I saw Bond from afar. He was with a girl. What in the world is this? I tried to strain my eyes to see. My god, isn't that me? No, it's the girl I hired to pretend to be me. What was she doing with Bond? And why did they look so close? Could it be? Hmm, I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie, is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> the giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare. I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores, so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer... I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even... Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh! Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, what rotten luck. I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. 
it wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gawping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me, and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But... A hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table, smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine. Great even. Until one day, when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know. But it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable, chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute while well, he thought I was too skinny. <sighs> then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. <sighs> the plan was all ruined. So, I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But, but how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist. But I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. I also changed water for milkshakes, 
but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang. I excitedly opened the door. But as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry. I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now. It doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. <sighs> so, it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. How ridiculous. You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh, how could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it, but on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk and I was an idiot forever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off. And worse still, she felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on, Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel, our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So, don't ever let idiots put you down. Because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. I was casually walking along the hallway, just minding my own business, when I felt a cold breeze rush through the hallway. I turned my head to see, and oh, it was Natasha. Ooh. 
I didn't mean to look her in the eye, but I did. Oh no, was she going to hit me? Panicked, I quickly glared down at my feet. My heart was thudding with fear, and inside my head, I repeated, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. But to my relief, she walked past me. Phew! Hi, I'm Marcus, and you might be wondering why I'm so afraid of that girl, right? Well, there's a reason why her nickname is Silent But Deadly. She's the tallest girl in the school. Intimidating, and she never utters a word. The school was full of rumors about her, such as how the last kid who messed with her ended up in intensive care. Nobody, and I mean nobody, should ever look her in the eye. Not unless they want to end up unconscious. I definitely just had a lucky escape. Thankfully, not all the girls in my school were as terrifying as Natasha. Nope. Instead, there was this really cute girl named Naomi. She's beautiful, sweet, and gentle. Only, she's also super popular and is dating Nicholas, the captain of the basketball team. So I just kept my feelings to myself and carried on with my life. <sighs> but wait, where's my notebook? I guess I left it back in the science lab. So I rushed in there and, oh no, Nicholas was there and he was reading my notebook. I quickly grabbed it off of him, but it was too late. He'd already taken pictures of the song lyrics I wrote about my feelings for Naomi. Blast it! <laughs> so let me get this straight. A nerd like you dares to daydream about Naomi? Uh, but we have a problem here. She's my girlfriend. Don't you know that? Uh, wait, it's not like that. I'll stay away from her, I promise. Nicholas gave me this unnerving look. Ugh, no good thing could ever come from a look like that. I braced myself for what he was about to do next. You have to do everything I say, else I'm going to ruin your life. Huh? Was he being serious? Judging by his devious smirk, yep, he was 100% being serious. I want you to ask Natasha out. Make sure you do it in front of the whole class. What? N Natasha? That scary girl? How could I... If you say no, the entire school will know about this. Then he waved his phone in front of me. Ugh, that vile Nicholas. But I couldn't risk my song being sent to everyone, so it looked like I had no choice. So the following day, I walked over to Natasha's desk and asked her, Natasha, um, will you be my girlfriend? The whole class was silent. Then they burst out laughing. She glared at me. Ugh, this wasn't good. I winced, preparing for the death punch. But instead, she let me out into a corner of the hallway. Then she gave me this weak smile, followed by a nod. Oh my god, did she just agree to be my girlfriend? This is crazy. It was completely beyond my expectations. But, whew, at least I was still alive, right? And that's how I ended up dating the scariest girl in school. She never spoke to me, not even a word. So I just helped her with her studies and carried her stuff around. We also exchanged numbers, but we only chatted through messages. Then one day when I was on my way to have lunch with Natasha, Nicholas strolled over to me and told me I had to take her to the cinema to catch this awful-looking rom-com, which didn't seem like her thing at all. But what other choice did I have? Nicholas' words were orders. So I asked her over lunch, and to my surprise, Natasha smiled, then gave me a big thumbs up as agreement. When I went to pick up Natasha, she was already waiting for me on her porch. She walked over with a notepad. Curious, I asked her why she had it, and she wrote, I won't be able to text you during the movie, so this will have to do. Yep, Natasha has always been different from everyone else, so I didn't ask anymore. During the film, I noticed Natasha was crying, so when it was over and we stopped for lunch, I teased her. I saw you crying during the movie. She slammed her notepad on the table after she wrote, I was not crying. I just laughed and took her home. Hmm, maybe she wasn't as scary as the rumors made her out to be. To be honest, she was also quite cute. <laughs> the more time I spent with Natasha, the more I started to warm to her. There was something I liked about her, even though we had only communicated through sticky notes. I was desperate to hear her voice, so I hatched a plan. When we were in the library on a study date, I picked up an old book and blew the dust in her face. She almost sneezed, but before she did, she placed her hand over her mouth and raced into the girl's bathroom. Then she returned wearing a mask. After that, I tried to make her laugh. I quickly took two pencils from the table and stuffed them into my nose and started making ugly faces. But Natasha just glared at me and handed me a note. If you continue to do these ridiculous things, there will be payback. Ha! Huh, no way was I giving up. 
So the next day, when I saw her by her locker, I rushed over to her and began imitating the voices of the minions. I thought it would definitely work this time, but no. Instead, she punched me in the arm. Ouch! Yep, I now learned that the rumor about her inhuman strength was not an exaggeration. So I just gave up and our relationship continued. Then one weekend, when I was at Natasha's house to study, I went down to the kitchen to get a drink, just as her mom returned from the grocery store. As I helped her unpack, we started talking. She told me about Natasha's love of collecting glass art, the pieces of which filled the house. Then her mom touched my shoulder and thanked me for making her daughter happy again. Oh man, this was awkward. Now I felt super bad. To divert the convo, I asked if Natasha talked at home, but she just smiled and replied, Natasha's such a quiet kid, right? Then she told me how it's because Natasha's always been taller than the other kids, but she has a squeaky voice. This led to lots of teasing, and once she got so upset, she pushed a boy over and accidentally caused him to have a nosebleed. Since then, people started to shun her, so she withdrew from herself and stayed silent. Hearing this made me feel so guilty. What I was doing was wrong, and Natasha didn't deserve this. Then her mom said something that truly shocked me. In middle school, this one girl named Naomi was horrible to all. The mean comments got so bad she refused to go into school for weeks at a time. Huh? Naomi? The same Naomi I know? No way! Confused, I told Natasha's mom I needed to leave and left her looking bewildered as I ran out of there. My mind was a mess. I had a crush on a mean girl. And I'm just as bad, if not worse, after what I did to Natasha. Then my phone rang with a text from Natasha. It said, Sorry if my mom said something she shouldn't have. You okay? I texted back, We need to talk tomorrow, please. So we decided to meet at her house the next day. Alone in her living room, I told her everything, including my notebook, liking Naomi and how Nicholas was blackmailing me. Natasha, please, you have to believe me. I'm sorry I did this to you. I saw the hurt look in her eyes. Then she threw a note at me and ran to her room. The note told me to get out, but before I did, I stood on the other side of her door. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I couldn't continue our relationship on a lie. Look, I like you, and I don't want to deceive you anymore. After that, I left, and I also texted Nicholas that I didn't care if he told everyone. I'm done being his puppet. The next day, I expected school to be intolerable, but to my surprise, nothing happened. Instead, I saw that Natasha was trying to sort out her locker. A crowd had gathered around her, and Naomi was taunting her. How does it feel to know that even your boyfriend likes me more? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Natasha carried on sorting out her books, but I could see that she was fighting back tears. Furious, I pushed past them all and told Naomi to stop. She just jokingly said, You know, if you wanted to date me, you could have just asked. You didn't have to spend so many months suffering with this giant scarecrow. You're right. I did like you back when I thought you were a nice person. But now I know the true you. You're a coward who only feels good when it's at the expense of someone's misery. And I can see why you target Natasha the most, because she has two things you'll never have. A true, kind heart and a loving spirit. After that, I pulled Natasha away and told her how sorry I am. But she didn't even glance at me and just walked off. A few days later, after P.E. class, I was about to go to the locker room when a classmate, Dante, came up to me. Marcus, help me carry the P.E. equipment into the storage room, please. I have a stomachache. He hugged his stomach, then hurriedly ran away. Without thinking much, I packed up the equipment and carried it into the storage room. As soon as I put it down, I realized that Nicholas, Naomi, and some guys from the basketball team were waiting there for me. Oh, well, Marcus, do you really like that weird Natasha? Didn't see that coming. Then the whole group burst into laughter. You have no right to say that to her. Take a look at yourself. Whoa, are you defending her? Then she turned to Nicholas. Babe, show him who's the boss here. Then she pulled out her phone and started recording. Nicholas smirked, then grabbed my shirt collar with one hand and reached out his fist to me with the other. I tried to struggle, but couldn't get out. He was too strong. Knowing I was doomed, I closed my eyes and awaited his punch, but suddenly a loud shout came out. Stop! I opened my eyes to see Natasha and a teacher standing in front of the door. Turns out she overheard Dante bragging to some kid about Nicholas's plan. So she came to my rescue. I looked at her gratefully but she turned away to avoid my gaze. Meanwhile, Nicholas hastily released my collar and lied to the teacher that we were just chatting. 
but of course he didn't believe him and summoned them all to the supervisor's room. After that incident, Nicholas, Naomi, and the rest of the basketball team were suspended from school for two weeks. They deserved it. But who cares? I have more important things on my mind, such as winning back Natasha. I knew that her birthday was coming up, and I remembered how she loved glass art. So I bought her a glass art figure of Cinderella's glass slippers with a ticket to senior prom and a card saying, Thank you, and happy birthday. I know what you did doesn't mean you forgive me, but I want to be your real boyfriend. So I left you a ticket for senior prom. If you come and dance with me, then I know you'll give me another chance. If not, then I know that it's over. But remember, you are a special person and deserve the best. The night of prom came and I was stuck there all alone feeling like a fool. This sucked, but after what I did, it was what I deserved. I didn't want to stick around here without her. So I was about to leave, but then my classmate tapped my shoulder and gestured for me to turn around. OMG. It was Natasha in the most beautiful crimson red dress. She walked over to me and then reached out her hand to ask me to dance. And of course, I accepted. As the song came to an end, she leaned in and whispered to me, Thank you, my hero. I can safely say that was the happiest night of my life, as it led to me having the best girlfriend ever. Oh, also her voice is actually really cute, although she does get annoyed with me when I tell her that. <laughs> Emma, your teacher, Mrs. Holm, called again. She said your grades are appalling and you don't pay attention in class. Why can't you be more like your sister? Yawn. Not this speech again. It's been like this ever since I started elementary school. In my mom's eyes, only my sister, Evelyn, inherited our dad's intelligence. While I'm just the senseless member of the family. Ugh, as if. She's only good with useless books. Bet she doesn't know anything practical. Like how dad's ethernet company works and such. But whatever, I don't care. I'm full. I announced as I got up and went to my little headquarters, the garage. I was busy working on my own personal project, so I didn't have time to give a hoot about who my mom's favorite child is. Oh, you must be wondering what I'm working on. Well, this device broadcasts Wi-Fi. Sounds familiar, right? But my device is able to broadcast across the entire city. Not only that, the connection is stronger and much more stable than the Wi-Fi people use at home. And it's more convenient without all the cables and stuff. This is without a doubt my proudest work ever. And what a coincidence that a few days earlier at school, Mrs. Holm announced that for the first time, the school was organizing an invention contest. Normally, I give school activities a miss. But this time was different. This contest could be fun, right? There was no time to waste. So I put all my spare time, day and night, into making my invention contest ready. And you won't believe what happened. I won first prize. And that's not all. One of the judges, Mr. Johnson, was so interested in my invention that he offered to invest in it. At first, I was kind of scared and hesitated to agree because, I mean, I was still in high school. But this was an opportunity of a lifetime. So how could I deny it, right? So after that, Mr. Johnson sorted out a manufacturing company and office space for me downtown. This is cool, but I prefer to work in my garage. It's just more convenient that way, with me still being at school and all. I upgraded my device and launched it to the public. And you know what? It was a huge success. Pretty much everybody in the city got rid of their old, laggy Wi-Fi devices and accessed mine. Then one day... I got a call from the local news channel asking to interview me and my family at home. Oh my god, yes! Oh, there's just one snag. I hadn't told my family about it yet because, um, I don't know, maybe I just know there's no way they'd believe me? Like the time I got an A in my physics exam and my mom instantly asked if I cheated. But, well, whatever. This is much bigger than that. So I quickly ran downstairs to the living room and excitedly told my family that the invention benefiting the town was mine. But Mum and Evelyn burst out laughing. So you're telling me that this Wi-Fi, which is broadcasting across the entire city, is your invention? Yeah, Mum, it's mine. 
Then Mum and Evelyn laughed even louder. Honey, it's bad enough you're failing at school. Please don't start lying. Ugh, forget about it. Why did I even try? Then, the morning after, when the doorbell rang, my mom opened it and saw a reporter and a cameraman. She couldn't believe her eyes. Mum and Evelyn exchanged panicked looks, then rushed upstairs to prepare. It was so hilarious. <laughs> The hysterics continued as they interviewed my parents. I watched my nervous, sweaty dad stand there like an awkward statue, while mom began bragging about me like, As soon as Emma was born, I knew she was a genius like her dad. I always encourage her to pursue her dreams. Jeez, and the Oscar goes too. My mom. I didn't know she could act that well. To be honest, since I could remember, mom never said anything nice about me. Ever. But now that she knew I was the mastermind behind the town's Wi-Fi, she would probably treat me differently. Right? Wrong. Then one night I came downstairs for a glass of milk and overheard mom and dad talking in the living room. Emma is such a selfish child. How badly will this affect your business? The truth is, the company's going through tough times. But don't worry, we're trying everything we can. Huh? Did I do something? And what's wrong with Dad's company? I tried to eavesdrop more, but suddenly I heard my dad standing up from the couch, so I quickly ran upstairs to my room. The next day, Dad forgot to take his lunch with him to work, so Mom asked me to take it over. But when I got to his company floor, it was deserted. Huh? Where was everybody? Did everybody get a day off or something? But that couldn't be it, right? That evening, over dinner... I asked Dad. I went to your office at midday, but not a single person was there. What's going on? Mom suddenly put her cutlery down and gave Dad a shocked look. Is what Emma just said true? Dad lowered his head and sighed out. Yes, it's true. I temporarily shut the company last week. I didn't want you all to worry, so I didn't tell you. I'm sorry. What? How could you? You said you would fix it! That's when it hit me. But I deeply prayed it wasn't the truth. So I asked him, is it because of my device? Dad didn't answer me. He just glared sadly down at his dinner. But I knew what his silence meant. I was right. Suddenly, Evelyn stood up and screamed in my face. It's all your fault! You invented that stupid device, and now Dad's business is at stake! That's so typical of you. You never think before you act. Then she stomped off upstairs. I just sat there speechless. I just wanted my family to be proud of me, but instead, it seemed like they despised me more than ever. Then Dad turned to me and softly said, Emma, this isn't your fault. I was kind of waiting for my mom to say something, anything at all, but she didn't. She just cleaned up the table. I felt really bad about what happened to Dad. But hey, now I had to work even harder so I could provide for my family, right? After that, Mom completely ghosted me. <sighs> As for my sister, whenever our paths crossed, she gave me a dagger look and muttered out mean comments like, Let's see how long it takes for your precious business to fail. I tried to ignore her, but then she took it too far. One Sunday, I was in my garage working away, when suddenly I heard loud noises coming from outside. I opened the garage door to see a crowd of people holding signs saying, We lost our jobs because of you, and no job, no future. My god, they were protesters. I think they were from my dad's office. Wait a minute, I spotted a familiar face. Evelyn? She was holding a big sign saying, my dad lost his job because of you. Eventually, dad came out and dispersed the crowd. Then he called an emergency family meeting. How could you do that to me? The correct question would be how could you do that to dad? Thanks to you, dozens of people have lost their jobs. You're making people's lives miserable. Enough, both of you. Evelyn, what you did was wrong. Families are supposed to support each other. But Dad, she- Didn't you just hear what I said? Evelyn gave me a dirty look 
Then she ran off to her room. I looked at Mum, who was leaning against the wall with her arms folded. Did she agree with what Evelyn did? Or was she on my side? My God, please say something. But to my surprise, after that, my mother started talking to me again, and she was actually being nice. She even started cleaning my room and workspace. Whoa, this was new? Had she finally accepted me? Then one day, I received tons of emails complaining about my Wi-Fi. It took me all day, but I finally found the cause of the problem. My laptop. Somebody had tampered with it. It didn't take a genius to figure out who it was. Evelyn, duh. But I needed proof, so I set up a trap. The next evening, when everybody was having dinner, I ran downstairs, quickly grabbed a piece of bread and said, I need to go run some errands. Oh, and can you please stay out of the garage as I'm uploading some important files? Mom and Dad nodded and smiled at me. Evelyn, on the other hand, just rolled her eyes and continued eating. Well, at least I knew my plan was in motion. I walked outside and hid behind the bushes. So, what's my plan, you ask? Well, I set up my laptop so that when anyone opened it, it would automatically send a notification to my phone and turn on the camera so I could see who it was. I waited for an hour, but still nothing. Then suddenly, my phone beeped. Somebody was opening my laptop. They hadn't switched the light on yet, so it was too dark to see them, but I was 100% sure who it was. Time to expose. What are you doing sneaking out here? Evelyn? What was she doing out here? Wait, if Evelyn was here, then who was it in the garage? Not answering Evelyn's question, I ran like crazy into the garage to capture this intruder. And as soon as I turned on the lights, I couldn't believe who was messing with my laptop. It was... Mom! What on earth was going on? I called a family meeting and told everyone what Mom did. Dad and Evelyn looked shocked and asked Mom why she did it. I just couldn't stand seeing your dad suffer anymore. He put his life into that company, and now he's just a laughing stock. Do you realize our neighbors and relatives have been gossiping about him? They think it's so pitiful that he lost out to his own daughter. So I did what any self-respecting wife would do. Was she serious? Why didn't she just talk to me? All I ever wanted was for her to talk to me. Nothing else. But no, she decided to go behind my back and try to sabotage my business instead. After her betrayal, I'd had enough. So I didn't speak to her and avoided her as much as possible. It was one thing for mom to be cold towards me, but I never thought she was capable of doing this. This went on for weeks, and it got kinda tedious. Trust me, it's no fun trying to avoid someone in your own home. But then one day, I arrived back from school and saw dad sitting in a corner in the living room, repairing his PC. Jeez, he looked so miserable. That's when the truth hit me. This was his passion, and I took it away from him. Suddenly, I understood why mom did what she did. She saw how disheartened he was, but knew he'd never say anything to me, because he's always supportive. But how can I fix everything? Should I give everything up so that my dad can reopen his company again? Ugh. Why was this so hard to figure out? Wait a minute. I think I have the solution. You must be wondering what my dad was doing here. Well, I came up with the idea that we should work together. My dad's a pro with technology, so it didn't take long to show him how things work around here. Oh, and since my business has grown, we were able to employ some of his former work employees too. With dad around to help, I have time to focus on my studies. Even Evelyn started helping out, and she was so good at it, I made her dad's assistant. Talk about a proper family business, ha! As for mom, we had a really long talk. I finally told her how awful her attitude towards me made me feel, and she apologized for everything she had done. I eventually forgave her. I knew she did that just because she loves dad very much. So, after all that drama, we're now just one big happy family. 